The Abyss Watchers of Dark Souls 3 are the stuff of legend. And we mean that literally. The legend of their patron saint, Knight Artorius from Dark Souls 1, motivates their entire existence. As an undead legion dedicated to ceaselessly battling the Abyss, they have deliberately modeled themselves off of the legend of Artorius. They behave with the unwavering dedication to fighting the Abyss that they believe Artorius did. They have codified their dedication to Abyss hunting by making a pact of drinking wolf's blood, honoring Artorius' loyal wolf, Sif. Their symbol, that of a gauntlet of swords plunged into the ground, is modeled after the image of Artorius' grave, except what they couldn't have known across the vast distance of time between them is that Artorius's legend is, of course, a lie. Artorius was corrupted by the Abyss. He didn't slay Manus and save Dusk, we did. That image of the Gauntlet of Swords, far from being a symbol of Artorius's honor, it's actually the product of grave robbers trying to pillage his monumental grave and being cut down by Sif. And that monumental grave isn't even his actual grave. It's a cenotaph. What the Abyss Watchers couldn't have known, but we do, is that Artorius died a corrupted, broken man. And his grave was a simple grave, with a delicate flower laid on the site of his death by one of his last remaining friends. The reason the Abyss Watchers don't know any of this is, of course, legend. The legend of Artorius sprouted, grew, and branched after his death. Legend has a funny way of doing that. Legends are produced and changed for all sorts of reasons. To protect one's honor, to serve political purposes, or to develop a unifying mythology of a people. Funny then that Artorius is the Latin name of Arthur, a perfect example of this process. King Arthur, the legendary and destined King of the Britons, who defended his people against Saxon invasions, ruled over a chivalrous and righteous era, and searched for the Holy Grail, is a legend created, adapted, and evolved over time by many people to serve many purposes, not the least of which is to develop a unifying mythology for the British people, a character from their shared history to rally around. That Arthur, if he even existed, almost certainly did not actually perform any of these deeds is besides the point. The legend has power unto itself. So powerful are such legends that it is often quite difficult to retrospectively ascertain the truth of what actually happened. In Artorius' case, we can know because we were present and actually played a role in the inception of the legend. In Elden Ring, there is no figure more legendary than that of Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. The legend is straightforward and powerful, that of a warrior of unmatched strength who becomes a righteous ruler through suppression of his aggression. But if we want to look past the legend, towards something more like the truth, we have to, just like we did for Artorius, uncover more about the origin of his story. But how can we do this if all the documentary evidence is contaminated with Godfrey's legend? Well, as it happens, tucked into an inconspicuous, ash-covered corner of Lane Dell, sits a building that stands apart from the rest, clearly dating to an earlier age than the surrounding architecture, indicating a site of particular importance to the city's grand history. Once inside, a vague, disorienting déjà vu washes over the player, and once on the second floor, the full realization hits, the hippocampus kicks into gear, and we realize that not only have we been here before, but actually many times. This abandoned old manor is the round table hold, our hub, our safe place. FromSoft had pulled this trick before, of course, in Bloodborne's abandoned old workshop, and just as in that game, the secrets held within Elden Ring's fortified manor revealed deep mysteries of the origin of one of its major characters. What the Round Table Hold reveals about Godfrey's legend will change what you thought you knew about him. This is the story of a band of warriors, its indomitable leader, and the inception of Landell's Golden Age.
Before we discuss the fortified manor, let's briefly put it into its context, that of broader Landell. We'll discuss the full inspirations of Landell's connection with real-world Byzantine history in a future episode, and in fact we've already touched upon some of the orthodox inspirations for perfumers and sacred tear chrisms. But for now let's just say that the grand golden architecture of Landell, with its golden domes, ornate arches, and Roman victory columns is a combination of High Roman, think Queen's Bedchamber and the Roman Pantheon, and New Roman, that is to say Byzantine, architecture. In fact, it's likely modeled off an idealized version of Constantinople, like the Vikings' description of what they termed Miklagard, meaning the great city, that we quoted in our very first episode. Quote, We knew not whether we were in heaven nor on earth, for on earth there is no such splendor or such beauty, and we are at a loss how to describe it. We only know that God dwells there among men, and their service is fairer than the ceremonies of other nations, for we cannot forget that beauty." End quote. Some even think that the mythic Asgard is based on Norse descriptions of Constantinople, and certainly one can see the resemblance with the golden city of Langdell. The peak architecture of Langdell, from America's bedchamber to the Erdtree Sanctuary, are truly awe-inspiring feats, meant to match the unimaginable splendor of their sacred Erdtree. So this makes it all the more intriguing then that amidst the architectural grandeur of Langdell, we have the fortified manor, which so clearly stands apart from the rest of the city. Its architectural inspirations are somewhat diverse, but most clearly model Norman-style British castles, such as Windsor Castle or Conway Castle. The identifying features are the mixture of circular but predominantly square towers, crenulated rooftops, the relative position of the towers in the keep, and the style of masonry. One can even see most of these features replicated on the manor tower shield, an old emblem of the manor. We're going to ignore, for now, the beast crest carved into the arcade, as it will be the subject of an upcoming mini-episode. Overall, it is an impressive but eminently more practical design its purpose being clearly defensive, rather than grand civic opulence. There are other castles in game that are of the same style, like Castle Morn, Castle Sol, and even Stormvale Castle, though the latter has been subsequently modified. The fortified manor is also, in a way, walled off within the city, made deliberately separate. And this wall around the manor is architecturally consistent with the rest of Lane Dell, but not with the manor meaning it was built by the same people who built the main city of Langdell. If we take a look at the map, we can see this corner of the city is clearly set apart from the rest, with a partially circumferential wall delineating it. The fortified manor, Colosseum, and Divine Bridge all belong to a separate architectural stratum, which appears to predate the main city. Based on this alone, we would propose that the fortified manor is from an older era of the city likely near its founding, before all of the golden splendor of the peak stratum was built. But to develop this possibility further, we need to analyze the interior of the manor, and, as it is quite dense, we'll need to catalog the evidence systematically in order to have any chance of understanding it. Starting from the entrance to the first floor, we immediately have an interesting feature, an old wooden door which is carved with the symbol of a tree above which we see a lintel with a scene of women carrying jugs. This, of course, is evocative of the libation statues, presumably pouring out sacred tear sap, seen in various religious structures throughout the lands between, but we'll leave that for the next episode. Moving into the Great Hall, we have banners of both Golden Lineage, which we know to be Sirach, as well as of the Banished Knights, something it shares with only Stormvale Castle. Throughout the Great Hall, as well as the upper and lower levels, we have evidence that this place was once a banished knight barracks, from their arsenal of weapons and storage, to their distinctive suits of armor on display. We also have various paintings of America and the Erd Tree, as well as the Tree of Yeshai depiction we know so well. How about the statues then? Well, here's where things get really interesting. First, let's look at the Erdtree Knight statues, which are clearly of the peak Langdell era, 
as we can see them lining the Roman victory style columns of the main avenue of the city, representing the victory of the Erd Tree and its champions over its many enemies. But there's another statue in the Great Hall, one which is found all throughout the lands between in ancient structures, such as the Divine Tower Bridges, the ancient underbelly of Stormvale Castle, and even the Eternal City of Noxtella. For now, we'll just call these statues the Saints, in reference to their only named appearance on the Saints Bridge in Limgrave. Clearly, this is no Erdtree symbol if it is found in the Divine Tower Bridges and even in Noxtella. It is here that we need to introduce a concept that we'll call iconographic stratigraphy, because without it, it is completely impossible to understand the fortified manor, much less the game in general. We don't actually know if that's a real term, but if it isn't, it should be. You see, when coming across areas which have been inhabited and in use over long stretches of time, often the same building will be repurposed, icons and statues will be modified and replaced to reflect the new order. This gives us a way to peer back into the multiple phases of use of a single place. Take, for example, the famous Hagia Sophia, which was built as a Byzantine church by the Emperor Justinian 1500 years ago, but is today a Muslim mosque. If one were to walk into the Hagia Sophia today, the initial impression would simply be that of a mosque, with the impressive minarets surrounding it seen long before approach, and inside the beautiful Islamic art as well as Arabic script. And yet, it bears the unmistakable evidence of its origin as a Byzantine church, from the architectural design to the Byzantine mosaics which have been painted over but are slowly being uncovered on the upper floors. In the apse, where the Christian altar used to sit, is a mihrab, which faces the direction of Mecca, flanked by ornate candlesticks brought by Suleiman the Magnificent. But up above it, one can still see the Byzantine mosaics of the Virgin Mary and Jesus. <laughs> Or better yet, take the Athenian Parthenon, which, after it became Christian and then Muslim after conquest by the Ottoman Turks, still retained its statues of Athena Parthenos and the other Olympian gods, but had additional symbols added representing the new order. Usually the statues of the old order aren't simply replaced wholesale, but they are modified or repurposed. So it is possible, based on iconographic stratigraphy, to reconstruct the multiple periods of usage of a single location. And one of the many things that makes FromSoft so absolutely brilliant in their world creation is that they frequently incorporate this phenomenon into their designs. If you think about it, you probably have already noticed this. Dark Souls 3's Cathedral of the Deep has a statue of the deacons placed conspicuously in front of the original statue of the crying woman telling a clear story of a cathedral that once practiced a particular worship, but has now been replaced by the worship of Aldrich, his deacons, and their corrupted vision of the deep. Likewise, in Dark Souls 3's High Wall of Lothric, a single statue of a beheading knight has been replaced by the statue of young Prince Lothric, an incredibly important transition point in that city's history. It's no coincidence that this specific statue becomes the flashpoint for the rebellion of the angelic knights, we only know that it's been replaced because in the timeless vortex of the drag heap, we can see the plaza and its statue in its original form. So we know FromSoft uses this technique as part of their brilliant storytelling. And with that idea in mind, let's return to the fortified manor. All that those banners of Sirach, paintings of America, and other superficial items tell us about is the most recent period of usage, since these are the easiest items to replace. If you move into a new house, you're going to take down the paintings of the prior owners. So here we see the most recent era of the manor is clearly centered on Erd Tree, Merica, and Golden Lineage worship. No surprises there, but unfortunately it doesn't tell us much about its original usage. How about the statues then? Well, here's where things get interesting. First, let's take a look at the saint statues. 
The pedestals upon which they sit have a characteristic clover design with a shield in the center. We can see this same design on all of the Divine Tower bridges, indicating these pedestals are from this era. And the saint statues themselves are found all throughout the lands between in places such as the Divine Tower bridges, beneath Stormvale Castle, and even in the Eternal City of Noxtella. If we look at the Erdtree Knights, however, they appear to have duplicated pedestals, perhaps indicating the original statue that once rested upon this pedestal has been replaced. More importantly, as we previously mentioned, these same statues line the main avenue of the city on victory columns, clearly associating them with the iconographic peak of Landell. While interesting, this is far from conclusive evidence, but let's at least entertain the idea that the fortified manor, aka the Round Table Hold, has gone through at least two phases of usage. One, initially characterized by the saint statues, and another characterized by the more common icons of Erdry and Golden Lineage worship. For simplicity's sake, we'll just call these the Saints Era and the Erdtree Era. This dichotomy would certainly be consistent with the architectural features of the Round Table Hold, which seem to be much older and predate the architecture of Peak Landell. Operating under this notion, let's analyze the other entrance to the fortified manor, the elevator from the Divine Bridge. From the Divine Bridge, we can immediately see the iconographic elements consistent with that earlier saint stratum. The saint statues are everywhere, as is the clover and shield emblem we mentioned on the pedestal. There is also an intricately carved rock relief with the same tree depiction that we've seen carved into the door to the manor. Across the way, we can see the Colosseum, which shares this same tree relief. If you're wondering why we have been avoiding calling it an Erd tree depiction, it's because, well, it isn't. More on that in the next episode, but for now we'll just say that if you compare this relief to the common stone relief depictions of the Erd tree, say on Merica's bedchamber or the Erd tree sanctuary, it looks nothing alike. So they are distinct sacred trees, and this one appears to be the older one. Moving from the bridge towards the elevator, we can see a clear junction or transition point between the architectural style of the Divine Tower Bridge, which is High Roman in nature with its elaborate Ionic capitals and Corinthian columns, and the masonry of the manor, which as we've established is basically a Norman fort. On the elevator ride down and in the adjacent courtyard, we can see the saint statues again and again, and in the courtyard they appear once again on their original pedestals. The saint and tree stratum definitely appears to predate the Erd tree stratum. While the fortified manor wasn't built at exactly the same time as the Divine Bridge, it is clearly built by people who share the same faith and symbolism. People of the same culture, but perhaps at a different time. This would explain one of our very first observations, that the fortified manor, along with the Colosseum and the Divine Tower Bridge, seem to be in a walled-off, older part of Langdell. It is likely that the Round Table Hold, or as it was then known, the Fortified Manor, was built as a defensive gate fort, protecting and controlling access to the Divine Tower. The founding of Langdell as we know it came much later. Now on to the second floor, which houses the Round Table itself. As we enter, past the nook where Hugh would sit, to the left in Fia's room, we see paintings of Godfrey and Merica, Chrism incensors, and Tree of Yishai woodwork, all superficial features of the most recent Golden Lineage and Erd Tree centric stratum. Like the banners we mentioned in the Great Hall, these don't tell us much about anything before the most recent era. In the throne room across the way, however, in addition to an Elden throne, only one of three in game, we can see hawk statues carved high into the walls ornate chairs for a small council carved with hawk symbols, and that same tree relief depiction we've mentioned several times, characteristic of the older stratum. This is exactly the iconographic combination we see in Stormvale, and here is our first major discovery of the fortified manor, which resolves the following apparent conundrum. If we have evidence that the fortified manor was from an older time than that of Peak Landell, to what empire did it belong? Well. When this room was initially used, it was part of the Stormvale, not Langdell, Empire. 
It belongs to what we'll just call the Kingdom of the Saint and Tree, after their icons. In Stormvale we see exactly this combination of Norman architectural features, old stone tree reliefs, hawk heraldry and statues, and even banished knight paraphernalia, the same that we see in the fortified manor. Whatever period in history this was, and whoever ruled over it, the fortified manor and Stormvale Castle both belong to it. This will be the major topic of our next episode. In this throne room we also find the coated sword, which explains what the round table hold became in its later years, as it reads, quote, Champions would gather at the round table hold in days long past, when the two fingers were masters of oration, their flesh yet full of vigor. End quote. Even this era, however, is long past. But why was this place so important to Godfrey and the Tarnished in the first place? What significance did it hold to them, such that they would choose this corner of Langdell to be their sacred meeting place? To answer that, let's take a look, finally, at the round table itself, which appears to be a kind of sword memorial of sorts, but of unknown origin. On the table there is a symbol of the Erdtree and Crucible incantations, not the later more refined Erdtree symbol, dating the table to the earliest times of the Erdtree, or the time of the Crucible. Throughout the room, scattered haphazardly in the little niches built into the stone, we can see all the weapons used by subsequent tarnished, from greatswords to axes to claymores. Clearly, these are from the most recent round table hold era, when it was used as a gathering place for tarnished champions. But on the round table itself, the swords are unique, are not otherwise seen in game, and appear to be bronze with a root-like design growing out of their hilts indicative of a much older period. As we've briefly touched upon in our Furumazula analysis, bronze weapons are indicative of an older culture than the iron weapons seen throughout the rest of the game. The roots growing from their hilts indicates an ancient tree worship. And interestingly, there is one weapon that stands apart from the rest, a giant bronze axe, which again is unique and not seen anywhere else in game. As this is not a public display, the symbolism of this scene must have some meaning to those who would sit at this table. To us, the overall impression given is of a memorial to an axe-wielding warlord and his inner guard, who laid down their arms together and commemorated the event with this table. If this is true, this can be no one other than Godfrey, or rather Horalu. It seems that this was the axe he used before he took the mantle of Elden Lord, and the axe that came with it, which is said explicitly to be a symbol of his vow to conduct himself as a lord. And so, the hilt of the axe points towards the adjacent room, the throne room, his first throne room as Elden Lord. This table commemorates the moment that Horalu became Godfrey, and his warriors became knights. The swords in the table even bear a rough resemblance to the Crucible Knight swords, and as we mentioned, the Erd Tree slash Crucible symbol is carved into the table. Though we can't know for sure, this scene seems to be telling us that the knights who laid down their arms became Godfrey's inner guard, now known only as the Crucible Knights. At this point, it's unavoidable to discuss the legend of King Arthur. It is a round table after all, the most famous item along with the magical sword Excalibur that's associated with King Arthur. The most common depictions of Arthur's round table, including the quote original round table which was ultimately shown to be a 14th century fake, have a similar motif of the swords pointing towards the center of the table, symbolizing the vow that Arthur and his knights took. Often they even have a Celtic cross carved into their center, much the same way that the crucible symbol is carved into Godfrey's round table. Rather than pulling his destined sword out of a stone like Arthur's Excalibur, Godfrey and his knights do the inverse and plunge their weapons into the bronze table. Of course, Godfrey's round table, like the famous Arthurian equivalent, 
indicates an egalitarian component to his relationship with his innermost circle, as there is no head of the Knights of the Round Table. But this image is clearly at odds with the throne and small council set up in the adjacent room. These warriors evidently gave up their relatively communal ways for the power and hierarchy of empire. And speaking of Arthur, much of Godfrey's arc may owe inspiration to Arthur's legend. The very first mention of Arthur was actually not to that of a king, but rather a warrior with unmatched battle prowess, just like Godfrey. Godfrey and Arthur's signature weapons are both famously broken in battle. Like Godfrey, in the later romantic tales, Arthur is ultimately undone and deposed as the result of a love affair between his queen Guinevere and his best lieutenant, the dashing Lancelot. Echoes of Merica and Radagon abound. Even the tarnishing may be inspired by Arthurian legend, as both Godfrey and Arthur are driven into exile across the sea only to one day return to save his people. So the round table signifies the moment that Godfrey and his knights took the vow to usher in the new age, the age of the crucible and ultimately the age of the Erd tree. But this room has more to tell us still in the statues dotting the perimeter. There are the Erd tree knights of course, which we've seen before, but there are also several distinct statues which depict a man cultivating a single branch with a golden flower. Like the Christian cross, which is merely a partial symbol of the full scene of Jesus' crucifixion, this symbol can only be understood by seeing its full depiction. The full depiction is shown elsewhere throughout the empire, notably on the imperial road leading to the grand lift of Dectus, in the Stormvale throne room, and elsewhere in Lane Dell. Whatever this statue represents, it must have been of the utmost importance to the followers of Godfrey. When interpreted together, the message of these statues, in full form and simplified, is clear. From the many branches, the many possibilities, a single golden one, representing the Erd tree and the golden lineage, has been selected. Regular listeners of the channel will not find it surprising that the concept of lineage and descent, as in the tree of Yeshai, is depicted with arboreal metaphor. But it's even much more specific than that. You see, these statues don't appear to be depicting a normal tree. The morphology is actually that of multiple distinct stems which are sprouting in competition, rather than branching in a regular pattern as a tree does, with a spatially periodic pattern. Visually, it bears resemblance to the Siluria's tree spear, which is said to be modeled after the form of the crucible. The inspiration for these statues, visually and metaphorically, seems to be in the process of root or crown resprouting, whereby a tree, after it is stressed or even felled, will produce multiple sprouts from its lower trunk or roots. This process is so consistent that it can be exploited in a process called copsing, during which trees are periodically felled at the base of their trunk and subsequent roots spring up from the stump. After a period of a few years, the tree has regrown and the process can be repeated to keep harvesting timber. This is a natural process that trees use to ensure their survival after some destructive event, like a forest fire. The statues in Landell appear to be depicting exactly this phase of the process, many competing roots sprouting early after the cataclysm which destroyed the trunk of the tree and a character cultivating the one sprout, which will eventually become the golden Erd tree. After all, we are told, quote, in the beginning, everything was in opposition to the Erd tree, end quote. The Erd tree was born one of many, but in the end, only it perseveres. You could say that the initial statue depicts the earlier form, the primordial form of the Erd tree, when it was only one of the many root sprouts of a prior great tree. Here, in the room where Godfrey became Elden Lord and his knights became Crucible Knights, we see a glimpse of the refinement of the Erd tree from its primordial form, the Crucible. If we take a closer look, this is what is shown in Siluria's tree, and on her helm, with the characteristic chaotic branching pattern. And from a bird's eyes view, the root sprouting from a destroyed trunk would look like a mass of branches growing from a central circle, precisely what is shown on the Crucible Night set. 
The form of the crucible is that of many root sprouts that emerge after the trunk of the tree has been destroyed, of which the Erd tree is the sole survivor. As for its function, and the great tree that preceded it, those discussions will have to wait until part two of this analysis. So let's summarize what we've learned thus far. The fortified manor was built before the rest of Landell, and seems to have been built specifically as a gateway fort controlling access to the Divine Tower Bridge. During this time, Godfrey and his warriors trade in their bronze weapons for the weapons of their new reign, a moment memorialized in the Round Table itself. At some point, the Round Table Hold becomes a gathering place for tarnished warriors, a term which of course has no meaning until the end of Godfrey's reign. Its iconography, in its initial phase, the Saint phase, is clearly that of an older era, one which reveres a particular tree, a tree that is not the Erd tree, and shares elements with Stormvale's iconography. Later on, the iconography shifts to focusing on Merica and the Erd tree, with a transition phase that emphasized the root growth of the Crucible. Far from being some unknown tribal warrior, as his legend would suggest, it would seem Godfrey was part of a vast empire, an outsider who took advantage of that prior empire's collapse, invading and adopting their ways. Even the names of the two named Crucible Knights, Siluria and Ordovis, share names with tribes at the edge of the Roman Empire in Britain. After all, the real Arthur, if he existed, was not the Arthur of legend whose chivalrous exploits have echoed through history. No, that Arthur was a legend invented many centuries later by those same Normans that brought all those castles to Britain. The real Arthur was a local warrior on the edge of civilization, who, after the Roman Empire receded and left Britain to fend for itself, established his own kingdom. Like Godfrey, Arthur created his own kingdom, owing much culturally to the one that had preceded it, but also striking out in new directions and cultivating new faiths. Like Godfrey, Arthur's legend looms large over his historical story. But it wasn't all legend. There was someone who at least inspired the legend. And in 1998, a stone was uncovered near Tintangol Castle, dating to roughly the 6th century AD, inscribed with the name Ortognu. Nobody knows for sure, but some think this name derives from the Celtic words for knowing and bear, meaning it could be a tribal name or Tognu, meaning wise bear. Perhaps, just as Horalu became Godfrey, or Tognu the wise bear became Arthur. In the next episode, we'll explore this empire of the great tree, which preceded Godfrey's rise his role and Merica's role in the aftermath of its collapse, and the ever-mysterious Crucible.